Hello again, this is John Tandy, and this is the series that I've titled, What is the Gospel and Why Should I Care? And if you haven't watched the first part, I would encourage you to go back and watch part one first, if you would. But uh, this part, part two, is entitled, Being Transformed in Christ. So in the first part of the video, uh, part one, I talked about how, what is the gospel. And I suggested that the gospel is life, and that life is in the life of Jesus Christ. Or rather, that that life of Jesus Christ is within you, if you have brought him into your life. And uh, those that have Jesus have life. And so in this video, I'm going to talk further on about a subject being, of being transformed in Christ. And I'm going to start by reading three verses from the Apostle Paul from the New Testament. And the first is from Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And this is a pretty familiar verse that you'll hear read a lot. And here Paul says, Be you not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. And the second verse that I want to read is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. And here Paul says, Therefore, if any man live in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then the third verse is from Colossians chapter 3 and verse 9. Lie not to one another, seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. And so I want to go back to that first verse in Romans 12, when Paul says that we are to be transformed. Uh, the word that Paul used there in the Greek was basically the basis of our English word metamorphosis. And so when you think of metamorphosis, what do you think of? And hopefully, um, more than likely, uh, your mind may go to the same place mine does, and that is uh, to a caterpillar. As we know that metamorphosis, you know, the caterpillar is changed from a one particular kind of creature into a beautiful butterfly. But if we think a little further about the caterpillar, you know, you can imagine that lonely caterpillar and uh, he may want to get up very high so he can, he can see far off in the distance. And so he climbs up a tall tree and very slowly with his own efforts and you know, with, his, with his legs, crawls up to the top of the tree and, and from there he can oversee a large distance. But that, that's as high as the caterpillar can ever get by his own effort. But we also know what's coming next because the caterpillar is, in a sense, and sort of an analogy at least, uh, the caterpillar has to die, essentially to his old life. And so it spins a, a cocoon, and then after a period of time, it breaks forth from that cocoon, and in a sense, uh, by way of analogy at least, uh, it's a new creature. That new creature comes forth, and it's way more beautiful to most of us anyway, than what the, the lowly caterpillar was because it's usually very colorful and uh, it has graceful wings. And maybe for the analogy's sake, uh, more, more importantly is that that caterpillar could only go so high. But that butterfly, when it catches the, win the winds of heaven, can fly much higher than the caterpillar could ever climb on the power of its own strength because it has wings and it can do things that the caterpillar could never do. And so I like to think of that. Not, not only did Paul literally use that term uh, metamorphosis or, or a related term for that in the Greek, but that is what he's talking about when he says we, we need to be transformed and to become a new creature, as he said in the other verse. Another analogy that I like, uh, it's a similar kind of thing from this, uh, came from uh, C.S. Lewis. Now, C.S. Lewis, for those that may not be fully aware, was a, a Christian theologian and author. Uh, some of you would know from his uh, Chronicles of Narnia, but uh, the book that I'm referring to today is uh, uh, Mere Christianity. But I would really pretty much recommend anything that C.S. Lewis wrote if you have a chance to go read those things because uh, he has a, a lot of really good perspective on, on Christianity and really making a, a defense of, of how Christianity really makes sense. Uh, but in mere Christianity, there's a lot of good things in there, but the one thing I wanted to, to use, a, a similar analogy that he made to what I just gave you about the caterpillar, and that is that uh, he talked about the horse. And so for those that are good with horses, which I am not, 
they can train a horse to get stronger and to jump over higher and higher hurdles and compete in competitions to, to jump hurdles, but there's only a limit to how high that horse can jump, and you can only make it jump so high. What C.S. Lewis suggested is that what God intends for us to do, what he intends as the purpose of and the end of Christianity, in the end meaning the purpose, is that he intends us to not become a bigger and a stronger and a greater horse, but he intends that God intends to transform us into the winged Pegasus. And if you don't know much about mythology, the Pegasus was a winged horse, and it would fly uh, with on its wings. And uh, C.S. Lewis made the point that uh, the winged horse, the Pegasus, could soar much higher than the and, and beat the natural horse at its own game every time. And his point is, as my point is, that we need to be transformed. Paul says that we need to become a new creature, not just a better person, not just a person who is good at keeping all the commandments, although that's certainly important, but we need to become a new species of creature, if you will. The kind of creature that we were born into has certain limitations and has certain characteristics, but when the scripture talks about us becoming born again, we are born into a new race of individuals, and that race of individuals live in heaven. And we become the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters, as it says in Mosiah, the third chapter. And so as we become children of a heavenly being, we take on the powers and have available to us the abilities that we could never do in our natural state. And so the other thing that Paul says is that we have to put off the old man before we can put on the new man. And so there is a, a death and a rebirth that comes along with being transformed in Christ. And I want to read another verse from Galatians. Again, this is from the Apostle Paul. And uh, today I've spent a lot of time on the Apostle Paul. Uh, next time I intend to spend time in some other places in Scripture. But there's just so many scriptures that I can't even get to in, in all of these videos that, uh, that go along with and, and illustrate this principle in many different ways. But in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, and this is an interesting verse, so I want you to pay attention as I read it. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, if you haven't ever really thought deeply about that verse before, or if you were reading along and, and listening along with me, and uh, you're like, well, that seems a little bit contradictory. And really, the interesting thing is, it is contradictory. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. I'm dead, but yet I live. But I don't live, but Christ liveth in me. And yet, the life that I now live... I live by the faith of the Son of God. And so you can hear Paul's tone there, almost, almost a paradox that he's expressing in like every other phrase. And in a sense, there is a paradox, but it's a profound truth, and it really is tied with the gospel, and why should we care? Paul says, I don't live now. I can't live for myself like I used to live for myself when I was living in the flesh. I must live, or rather, Christ must live in me. And I'm taking Paul literally here that Christ lives in us. And yet, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And so we can't just say Jesus does it all. We still have to live the life. We still have to go through the motions. But all the while, we have this spirit of Jesus Christ, that presence of the living Savior that is, if you will, living our life right alongside us and helping us to walk in his steps. I want to next talk about fruit, and again, the Apostle Paul comes through here in uh, giving us a very memorable verse about fruit, and this comes from the fifth chapter of Galatians, in which he says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Now, I don't know if you have an apple tree in your backyard, but if you do, or let's just pretend you do, You'll have to w wait for a very long time before you can pick oranges off of that tree. In fact, it will never happen. And the reason why you can't pick oranges off your apple tree, of course, is because you have the wrong kind of tree. 
if you want oranges, you need to plant the right kind of tree, which is an orange tree. Otherwise, you'll never get it. And so when we talk about fruit, and Jesus in the Gospels said that you would know the people, you would know people by the fruit, whether it's good fruit or whether it's evil fruit. And so every one of us is known by the fruit that we bear, and that fruit that we wish to bear is that kind of tree that we should be planting in our lives. And so the gospel tells us that every person that is born is born sinful. Now, we could spend a lot of time talking about how that is and the theological ideas behind uh, sin and how sin came into the world and those things. I'm not going to go there right now, but I think we can probably pretty easily see by our experience that sin is prevalent throughout the world. And we all do things that we regret and things that are just outright wrong and, and bad and destructive many times. And the reason we are that way is because we're born with the wrong tree. We're born a natural tree and we're going to bring forth natural fruit. And Paul talks about in the fifth chapter of Galatians, I won't read that verse, but he talks about the fruit or the, the works of the flesh, which are basically the fruit of our natural or our, our fleshly self. If you have the wrong kind of tree, you'll bring forth the works of the flesh. But if you're born of the Spirit, then you'll bring forth the Spirit fruit. To put it uh, more succinctly, a Spirit tree brings forth Spirit fruit. And so if you want spirit fruit, you know what kind of tree you need to plant. And so again, as Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, I want you to think about where does that fruit come from? Paul doesn't say, love more so that you can become more spiritual. There might be truth in that as well. But Paul basically says the fruit comes from the Spirit. And so if you want to be more, more loving, you need to be first become more spiritual or being filled with the Spirit. It works that way around, is that we can't work our way into the kingdom. We can't by any number of good works or good efforts or, or good intentions ultimately bring forth the fruit of the Spirit because we don't have the Spirit. And so we cannot bring forth that fruit that, that comes from above. And we know that this world needs more love and more joy. As I said in the previous video, and that is what God intends to do, is to bring forth that fruit of the Spirit. And ultimately, God wants to bring forth a kingdom. And we believe that He wants His kingdom to be established on the earth. Jesus said that we should pray that His will would be done on the earth as it is done in heaven. The only way that His will can be done on earth as it is in heaven is by having heavenly people occupying earth and bringing forth heavenly fruit. And so that is what God is calling you to do, is to change the world. That is why you should care, why I should care, and why all of us should care about spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just teaching the principles, which are important, but really propagating that nature of life, which is the life of Christ throughout the world, and inviting as many people as possible to come. And that's why we call it Proclaim. To proclaim the good news, to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, and that is hope. So before I close, um, I wanted to read one very short scripture, or part of a scripture, once again from the Apostle Paul, if you bear with me one more time this, in this episode. And this comes from the book of Colossians, in chapter 1, in verse 27. And I'll just read part of this verse, but Paul talks about this mystery. And it really is kind of a mystery. But he says, The mystery is Christ in you the hope of glory. Christ in you is hope. And Christ in you is the hope, specifically the hope of glory. So when we talk about Christ in you being the hope of glory, that is Christ's goal. And that is the, the hope and the work of the gospel is to propagate Christ throughout the world. Not just in general in the air somewhere, but Christ has to be in you. And through you, he propagates to Others and all people are invited to come into Christ and to partake of, of those blessings, those fruits, and those good things of the kingdom. And uh, so I hope that you'll continue with me on this, uh, in this series and us in this journey. And uh, next time I will talk a little bit more in detail on the subject of what is the gospel and expand more on what it means to be born again. 
There are a lot of churches that talk and Christian people that talk about being born again. What do they mean by it? And what do we mean by it? And how does that work uh, in, in uh, becoming born again? So we'll see you next time and uh, we'll invite you back. And until then, uh, be blessed and go with Christ. Proclaim the glory.